All right. This brief little lecture is to uh, help orient you to some of the techniques and data for the paper. The parasite derived 68 more peptide, blah, 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 blah. All right. And so I will post the lecture link once I get this recorded and uploaded onto YouTube. So let's talk about this little liver fluke. All right, so this is a helminth, a little parasitic worm. Um, and I hope you will read some background on the hygiene hypothesis. You'll notice that there are a couple mandatory discussion um, prompts that I'm posting for this paper to make sure you've got a little bit of background as to why we're even reading this paper and why we even want to look at these little guys. Um, hygiene hypothesis is pretty interesting and you know, one of the take homes I got from it was that they're finding that in the developed world, developed world, developed countries, there's a much higher incidence of autoimmune disease and things like asthma and allergies than there are in developing countries. Now, Obviously, developing countries have a lot of other issues, but this is something that we need to think about um, in a country like the United States, um, where we're seeing, like again, this increase in autoimmune diseases. And this paper looks at two, type one diabetes and um, a mouse model for multiple sclerosis. And so the background is, is that these guys, and I honestly have no idea, so I'm going to just go for it. Fascicola hepatica, the liver fluke. Um, they had previously seen that some, oops, ah, let me just start over here. Some excretory, oh, let me try again, slash, secretory. So if you look up these two words, it's a little bit different as to how a cell um, passes these molecules across their membrane. So basically what they're finding is these molecules are outside the cell and um, this kind of solution was shown to prevent autoimmune disease in mice. So the question was, what is in this secretory, excretory mixture. And they found two main components. And the cool thing is, is that they were able to synthetically make these. And so these are peptides, which means amino acids, and FHHDM1 is a 68 mer, which means it's made up of 68 amino acids. And you'll see this is the one we really focus on. So like I said, the cool thing is, that you can express this in yeast, which means you can artificially produce these little amino acid peptide chains um, so you don't have to go harvest a bunch of liver flukes and grow them up and purify away these components. So that's kind of cool. That means that if this could be a treatment, it could probably e be easily synthesized in the lab. So they're going to look at these two and see how they work individually. And they're looking at two different diseases. Type 1 diabetes is caused by the destruction of beta cells in the pancreas. Oops. So the beta cells are insulin producing. Oh my gosh, I'm really having a hard time. Insulin producing. Okay. And insulin is a regulator of your blood sugar levels. So it helps tell the cells to take in blood sugar or not, depending um, on the levels in your blood. And so these mice, these nod mice, non-obese, so they're not obese, but they have diabetes, which means they have issues 
controlling blood sugar level. So in uh, these um, mice, and if you want to find out more, here's a link about these mice, you usually see insulitis. So this is microscopic. Oops, microscopic. At about five weeks, you start to see this destruction of the beta cells. And then you'll see diabetes, which is this lack of sugar control at 16 to 30 weeks. Okay, so that's their one um, mouse model. And what they're going to use as the diabetes kind of cutoff to determine the mice have diabetes is that they're going to measure blood glucose levels weekly. And two consecutive means two in the row in a row, two weeks in a row, two consecutive. That always looks weird when you write things. Measurements of 14 millimolar. Well, that's just a mess. 14 millimole per liter of glucose. If you get those for two weeks, or if you if the mouse shows that level of glucose in the blood two weeks in a row, they're determined to have diabetes. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide because obviously it wants to go there. So just to orient you on figure one, this estimated survivor function. So survivor function is the probability that I really have bad handwriting today. A patient will survive beyond a specified time. So it's a weird thing, but basically it means um, as the blood sugar levels are not controlled, the survivor function decreases. Okay, so you start off with everybody, all the mice looking nice and healthy, and then um, each of this, this is measured as a percent. As you get mice hitting um, the diabetic marker, which is two weeks of uh, 14 millimoles per liter glucose levels, you'll drop down and you'll say, oh, wow. Okay, less mice probably will survive. So in other words, more mice have disease. So this is disease. The higher you are, it means, oh my goodness gracious. This is what I get for leaving it until Saturday night. Healthy. Okay. This data is based on histology, which means looking at the cells, looking at tissue under the microscope. Okay. So this kind of confirms this other data, although this was done at 13 weeks, which is interesting. So I think that means there was two cohorts. Um, I will say I have some issues with the way they describe the methods and some of the figure legends. Um, I'll kind of point those out as we go. Um, but anyways, well, you figure out the take home. That's your job. Sorry. Okay. I wanted to help explain some of that. And it talks about the grades of this in the um, paper, what they all mean. Basically, grade zero is no um, death of the beta cells. Okay, the second disease they're going to look at is EAE, which is experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, okay, which is basically a mouse model for multiple sclerosis. 
Um, and the way they trigger this, they trigger the EAE by this peptide, so again, a, a amino acid called PLP139151. So it's actually a, um, a very strong inducer, and when you give this to the mice, it causes them to have um, multiple sclerosis-like symptoms. And multiple sclerosis is also an autoimmune. So in diabetes, the body's attacking the beta cells and destroying them. In multiple sclerosis, the body is attacking the myelin sheath on a neuron. And if you remember from cell biology, if you took cell biology, um, the myelin sheath is the insulator for the neuron and it actually helps transmit the electrical signal down the neuron. And when you destroy this, you don't get um, good signal transduction. So what they think is happening is that multiple sclerosis is ca caused by pro-inflammatory cytokines, which means chemicals that cells secrete that induce um, inflammation. And inflammation, you learned about um, the first part of this class, can cause damage um, to cells. And that damage is that it's damaging the myelin on the axons. axons. So here's just a really simple figure, and the, the important thing is this distorted message. So um, you get loss of, mu loss of muscle control, um, which is a hallmark of multiple sclerosis. So people um, with bad flare-ups um, can be wheelchair-bound. The crazy thing about multiple, multiple sclerosis is that it comes and goes. So we call it having flare-ups. So people will have days or periods of time when they're having a very hard time moving, and then it will seem to go away. So maybe things are getting repaired, and they'll be okay, and then it will flare up again, and it's very unpredictable, and it's very different person to person. Um, I just threw up this other figure. Um, uh, as I said on the homepage, I can't help you with figure three. I don't really understand. Um, I don't know my histology. I like this figure because this is showing normal um, tissue in a um, spinal cord, and then um, spinal cords from an EAE mouse. And what you can kind of see over here is that there's kind of holes, bare areas, where the myelin has been destroyed. And if I knew what I was looking for, I could tell you there's a large number of immune cells coming through. So basically what this is saying is this is damage and this is gonna cause the disease. So figure two, um, this I grabbed from the methods section, and I know sometimes students don't read the methods, that's why I try to go over them with you because it can be very complicated um, if you haven't worked in a lab. So basically um, what's going on up here is they're deciding, they're scoring if mice have symptoms of multiple sclerosis or the EAE. And the symptoms or, or the score is from down here. So a score of zero means you're normal. Um, and then you can see, um, so no disease, decreased tail tone, slight clumsy gait, so they're not walking as well, um, moderate clumsy gait, poor writing ability. So if a mouse falls, falls over, it has a hard time standing up weakness, paralysis, and moribund means you have the disease. So these mice um, are not able to um, move hardly at all. So that's where this clinical score comes from. Um, then they talk about basically flare-ups. So what they're gonna see in this these mice, and what you can see here is, um, they have bad days and they have good t days and they have bad days and good days. And so now they're going to say, okay, for each little mouse that we have, that's a mouse in case you didn't know, 
Um, for each little mouse, we have how many times did they have some bad days? How many times did they have um, issues with their gait? Um, and so they're comparing mice with PBS only. So PBS is a control. Remember, whatever you do to one animal, you have to do to another. Um, you saw this in the, the Toxo paper. Um, and then you've got your two different components from um, the fluke worm. Okay. And so the percent of free of EAE means that how many mice never showed any symptoms? And you can see that only with the FHHDM1 um, peptide did you get some mice that were disease-free for the entire 70 days. Okay, so after they look at just basically generally does this peptide help prevent disease or not, then they try to figure out why. So what's going on? Okay. And regulatory T helper cells are thought to, their role is to suppress autoantigen specific um, T cells. So T cells differentiate. So they become different types. TH1, TH2, TH17, and T regulatory. Um, did I say that right? And so they're trying to measure cytokine level to determine if these T cells are being stimulated to be uh, produced. Okay, so they're looking at um, TNF, they're going to look at interferon gamma, they're going to look at IL-17, where are you, IL-17, and they're going to look at IL-10. And I may not have said this quite exactly right. Um, but these are called autoantigen specific cytokines produced by these different T cells. And so they want to say, okay, so is this peptide working by inhibiting autoantigen and specific cytokines, right? So are they inhibiting this autoimmune response through the cytokines? And so you'll look at figure four and you will try to decipher and I will tell you, this is one that I find errors in their figure legend. Um, so let's circle these for a minute. So A and B are showing, if I understand this right, from diabetic mice on day 15. So they're using a cytokine beta ray, which we talked about in the Toxo uh, methods. Okay. And they're taking um, cells from this diabetic mice at day 15, and they're seeing, okay, um, whether you got control or you got the um, worm peptide, what are your levels of cytokines produced? C and D are from the EAE mice at day 70, so after all the treatment. Um, and so again, looking at different cytokine levels, B is um, looking at cell division. And I'm not exactly sure why, unless they're trying to um, show that these cells are alive and dividing. And CFSE, here's a, a reference to it is just a stain to track cells. And so they're asking, are the cells dividing or not? You guys can work on figuring that out. It's a little confusing to me. Next technique that we haven't talked about yet is something called flow cytometry. So flow cytometry is where you take a mixture of cells and you actually mark them with antibodies Um, and these antibodies are specific to cell surface 
molecules. Okay, so a cell, say it's producing CD4, under the microscope looks the same as a cell producing CD8. But you can get an antibody specific to it that glows a specific color. And as you pass this um, mixture of CD4, say CD8 cells, it will count, okay, you got one CD4, you got two CD4s, oh, that's a CD8, okay? And so it can count and differentiate um, cells from a whole population. What they are doing is not only looking at some of these, we call them cell markers, so you know exactly what type of cell it is, but they are also um, labeling FHHDM1, and I'm going to put this as a label with this Alexa floor. So it's going to look green. Okay, so now you're asking, okay, not only what kind of cells do we have, but does this peptide, FHHDM1, does it stick to certain cell types? Okay, and so this would show green, and we would know it's CD4, and we might have a totally separate antibody for CD8, and we don't see any green, so we know it's not um, FHDM, FHHDM1 is not sticking to it. Okay, so they're trying to look for interaction between the cells. And so what they'll look at different populations, and so let's look at figure 5A. So the gray little skinny ones um, are from the, I didn't write it down, from the PBS mice. Okay, so these, all these gray, you can kind of see them in there. And the black lines are from the mice that got FHHDM1. And let me just like, I don't think it's from the mice, I think it's from, uh, it's, sorry, it's from, um, Cell division, cell binding, four week old mice. Oh yeah, so they injected the Alexa Fluoro 488 labeled FHHDM1 into the mice and then they cleaned out the cavity and isolated the cells. Okay, sorry. So this is telling you, did the peptide stick and this is telling you to what kind of cells okay. and you'll get this from the um, uh, paper basically saying here with the PBS mice that FHHDM1 didn't stick to anything because they didn't have it right but from the mice with FHHDM1, it stuck to macrophages, not CD3 positive T cells and not CD19 positive B cells. I think that was a little confusing how I explained that, but hopefully you get the message. Okay, again, pro-inflammatory cytokines. So the question is, okay, um, is, is this uh, worm molecule preventing pro-inflammatory cytokines? Okay. So they're using, so they're looking at TNF and IL-6, okay, which again is going to increase inflammation. And they're using something called LPS, which you know from, is um, an endotoxin from bacteria. And LPS will stimulate secretion of these pro-inflammatory cytokines. Okay, so they're saying, all right, can FHHDM1 
prevent this. All right, so this is figure five, um, B, C, and D. Um, these are looking at mouse macrophages. That's how you abbreviate macrophage, macrophages. Um, and they incubate them with the HDM1 peptide at different concentrations. And then they add LPS to stimulate these cells. And then they measure cytokine production. Scrambled peptide is a control. So this is just a nonsense peptide that shouldn't do anything. To me, this is very strange data. Um, this is TNF production, this is IL-6, and they say this is by ELISA assay. And we talked about ELISA assay again in the TOXO intro, so if you don't remember what that is, go take a look at that video. But this is not typical ELISA data, right? We had ELISA data in the last paper. Um, so this is very strange data to me. Um, what they say is the data are means plus or minus standard error of the percent maximal LPS stimulated TNF released. So I'm guessing at zero, you get 100% TNF stimulation, and you go from there. So the more FH HDM1, the less stimulation and the less TNF produced. I, I, I Hopefully I'm missing something and someone can enlighten me, um, but I don't understand IL-6, are they comparing it to TNF levels as well? I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confused. Um, so you guys chew on that one. This is typical ELISA data, right? You see the amount of that cytokine in picograms per mil. And so this is saying if we added saline, which is the same as PBS, or we added the LPS for six hours or 18 hours, how much TNF is produced. This one I get, this one I'm having a little bit of issue. Um, again, discuss, talk amongst yourselves. Uh, um, and figure five, same kind of data as before, but this is with human cells. So of course you always wanna go human to get the next grant to say, hey, this is worth something. Um, again, this is TNF, this is IL-6, supposedly ELISA, but I'm going to say not typical ELISA data. Um, they took the human cells, they added various concentrations of the HHDM1, then they added LPS, and then they measured cytokine levels. All right, so that's my help to you with uh, the data and methods. Um, as always, ask questions. Um, and I just want you to remember why we're doing these um, small group discussions. One important part is that you need to show me what you know, what you understand, what you are thinking. So please, again, look at the grading rubric. It's not just about asking questions. It's asking questions that further the conversation. It's giving your opinion and then other people saying, yeah, I agree with you, but, or yeah, I agree with you because. So don't let everybody just post and you take in all this information. That means you can probably do fine on the news and views, but you're not gonna get the participation points. You guys are supposed to work together 
to help each other figure out the paper, the methods, the results, the conclusions, the take-home messages, why they did what they did. What does it all mean? What's the big picture? Like, why do we care about this? Um, so I really, I, I'm grading you very easy on the first set of discussions um, because I know this was a big switch from the first six weeks of class. But you guys have got to be participating, like I said, just about every day, if not at least every other day. You got to post. Um, it's frustrating for other members of your group if they're the only ones in quotes, talking. All right, I look forward to reading your discussions and uh, I guess that's it. Thanks.